Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail. Today, we will share real Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story, Wendigo. When I was in my first year of college, I lived with my mom by ourselves. My dad had passed the year before, and we moved out of the house shortly after. I was glad because I had suffered a lot of paranormal trauma growing up there and was glad to get out. One night I was driving home on Highway 111 North after youth group and I saw something that still bewilders me. It was lightly raining that night. Mist crawled across the road from the cow fields on either side. The lights from the few gas stations nearby were reflected in the wet asphalt. I was driving about three car lengths behind a dark minivan with nobody else in sight on the roads. All of the sudden, I saw the van swerve to miss something in the middle of the road. I was going too fast, and the road was too slick to miss it. All of the sudden I saw, framed in my headlights and silhouetted in the glowing red brake lights of the van speeding away, a tall muscular man with the upper shoulders and head of a buck. It was like a minotaur but a deer head instead of a bull and glowing red eyes. I clinched and braced for impact and then passed right through the figure. It was like it dissolved right into the mist. I am used to swerving to miss deer at night but I should have nailed this thing on the driver's side. Nothing. I was too afraid to look in the rear view mirror as I gassed it and sped home. I was only a couple of miles away which was both comforting and terrifying at the same time. I raced in the door and locked it behind me. I told my mom who laughed it off but was disconcerted at my pale, clammy complexion. I only later found in research of being described like what I saw. The Wendigo A Native American legend that was terrifying to me as a child but I had never heard it described like this. I had never heard of any creature like this until that night on a dark highway, 111 that I will never forget. Second story. Dear Lady, Encounter in the Woods. I have no idea what my eyes were actually resting on, but this story is 100% true. In the late 90s my sisters, and I used to walk along a stretch of the Katy Trail that ran through Columbia, Missouri. For those of you who have never heard of it, it used to be a 225-mile stretch of the Missouri-Kansas-Texas railroad line that runs largely through scenic woods and countryside and alongside the banks of the Missouri River. When the railroad ceased to operate, the tracks were pulled up and the path was converted into a fitness trail. Here is a photo that illustrates what it looked like that afternoon. It was a beautiful, early fall afternoon and one of my sisters and I had decided to go for a walk. It was late in the day slash early evening, and we were looking forward to having the trail to ourselves, since most people usually cleared out by that time. We thought that we'd have just enough time to walk the two miles to our usual stopping point, turn around and get back to the car before full dark. The walk from Scott Boulevard to the Perchy Creek Bridge was lovely but uneventful. We started back, and at about the halfway mark started realizing that it was getting dark much faster than we had anticipated. We picked up the pace as much as possible without actually running, and were laughing about the ensuing creepiness of the evening and the cloud of vampiric mosquitoes that followed in our wake. It was just to the point of dusk when visibility is not really an issue for about 200m, but any further and things become indistinct. We were on part of the trail that was slightly elevated from the surrounding area. Down the hill to the left was a large field, and on the right, a gentle slope down to a barbed wire fence with scraggly woods beyond. The ground down there was soft-looking dirt covered with freshly fallen leaves. We were just trucking along, when suddenly movement in the woods startled us. I turned my head just in time to see something moving rapidly away from us, pretty much perpendicular to our current location, about 200 feet away. The first thing that caught my attention was the long, dark flowing hair streaming out behind as it moved away. The second thing was the pale lavender, 
70s-looking blouse with frilly wings that fluttered in the breeze as it ran. The third thing was the brown, indistinct, what can only be described as naked deer legs that it ran on. I say ran because it didn't bound like a deer would and there was no white tail. And even though it seemed to run like a human fleeing for its life, it was moving very rapidly across a sea of dead leaves and yet made no sound at all. In less than two seconds, it was gone. I felt no fear at all, only startlement. We looked at each other and were both like, um, what the fuck did we just see? She didn't appear to be overly frightened either, but it was still getting darker and we still had a mile to go through the woods. We both smoked at the time and at that point neither of us could run all the way back to the car. So there was nothing we could do except keep up our present pace and try not to freak ourselves out with conjecture. We got back to the parking lot without further incident, burned out of there and went and told the rest of our family what we had seen. Seeing odd sights runs in the family, so no one was too freaked out. But we also could never come up with a good explanation for what we had seen. Later I did an internet search for any murders or disappearance that happened in the area in the 60s or 70s, but found nothing. Third story. Full body apparition while deer hunting. I am a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So of course when I decided to go to college I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was a must. Upon checking a couple of places out, I decided on going to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, or just the borough. The biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there, and was a well-known name in the community. He owns to this day a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. That's all I really needed to pick the college I would be going to. Edinburgh is really cool because there are a lot of old buildings and strange, flat landscapes as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to have to figure out how to scout the game I'd be going after once the season started. My main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was a true thing of beauty. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that were found in the woods behind the house. More on that later. As I was scouting the area for the first time, I came up on a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. They were definitely very old. The boulders were quite big. Much too big to just be moved there for some reason like a group of guys camping out. They must have taken 10 men to move them, and only if they had some kind of pulley system or something of the sort. There were also smaller rocks, and when I say smaller I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more, making inner circles inside of the large boulders. Pretty crazy. I found a total of 7 of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks that were now part of the chimney. They simply had to be with the amount of rocks he used on it. Oh. Also these rock circles also made a much larger circle around the woods. After a few more days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure we had our spots picked out for first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there. Perfect day too. It was great. The thing about Edinburgh... Pennsylvania is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. What happens is before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way high up into the atmosphere. Too high for them to actually snow due to the low temperature all the way up there. The clouds then come inland and fall back toward Earth. It takes them about 20 miles to do this. Edinburgh is about 20 miles from the lake. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, on the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow. This is perfect for archery because you can see the deer in the woods much more easily, and you can also see if any animals left any tracks. If they did, 
They were fresh since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about two hours, or so neither of had seen anything yet. I had just got off the radio with Brandon, whom was on the other side of the property, when I seen some movement over to my right in the pine thicket. I then seen a branch move a little bit, and seen four deer legs under. I readied my bow and my stance so as to make a good clean shot at the deer. Around fifteen feet up in a tree, I did this very carefully. About a minute later, as I was looking for any movement, I lost the four logs inside of the thicket. This was expected due to the fact that where that deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I waited. Maybe another minute later I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods. The moment I've been waiting for. As I brought the bow up into a full draw stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was a man. A strange looking man at that. This absolutely should not have been. If there was a man anywhere near where that deer had been, the deer would have been long gone, spooked back into the thicket. I put my bow back down onto the hook I had screwed into the tree and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. At only around 35 yards away, I could now see great detail of his physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with his belly leading the way. A white, long sleeve shirt on with ruffles down the middle of it. Just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you so indulged, it was tucked into thick, canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down, where his shoes should be, was absolutely nothing. He had no feet whatsoever. No calves, no shins, no shoes. With my eyes wide open I mouth to myself, what the fuck? Instead of walking, he seemed to float through the woods, going from right to left. This is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head. It was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large, red, bulbous nose up in the air a bit and a sort of snobby overall look. The hair though, the hair... It was covered by a wig that judges in England wear. A white wig with three curls on the side of it where his ear would have been. I noticed that he didn't just seem to float through the woods. He was floating through the woods. His arms stayed stuck at his sides unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down. The way his head was cocked he could have only been looking upward. This is not any person or animal walks in the woods constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you may trip over. All of this happened within a time period of maybe 20 seconds or so. He had came out of the thicket behind a medium-sized oak tree. Then when he hit the next oak, he never came out from behind it. I watched in absolute astonishment for another five minutes waiting for him to break his cover so I could see him again. This never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened and was immediately made fun of. I expected that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was saying I should have taken a picture of the only deer slash human minotaur remaining in the world. I told him he won't be laughing when the deerator came over to his tree stand and smacked his ass right out of it. Even though it was the middle of the hunt, I had to get down to see what the hell just happened. I knew where he would have walked not only would I see footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact that the area where he was, was full of muddy ground. A freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. As you probably guessed, when I got over to the spot where he had been, I see not one track from him, or a deer, or anything else that lives on planet earth. I was utterly amazed. What happened later that night was just as creepy, but due to this post being super long, I'll save that for my next post. The scary stuff didn't even begin yet at this point on that fateful night. Part 2
After I got done checking out the muddy slash snowy ground where the man should have left some kind of sign or footprints, I went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that I'd been hunting from earlier. I radioed Brandon and told him I was back up the tree and secure. We always did this as a precaution in case something happened while we were climbing the tree or securing the platforms of the portable tree stand. My old man's buddy Bunky actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless. He was practicing shooting from a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. This has nothing to do with the story, but all you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know. The more you know, and all that shit. I digress. We hunted the rest of the day, but not without periodic ragging from Brandon making fun of me about the deerator throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or so, maybe longer. That is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one. Which, it turns out, was not. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we found while scouting in the months prior. So I had him meet me at my spot due to the fact that it was going to take me much longer to get my stand down and off the tree. Just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot, right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet, jumped down to the ground, and started feverishly explaining to him again everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or the mud. I definitely could sense that he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily because he looked right at me with his mouth agape and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forward and said, Are you fucking with me, brother? He also was able to tell that I wasn't messing with him when I looked at him with what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes he's ever seen and said, Hell no I ain't fucking with you. When he realized that I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all of the things that I had previously told him and we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had seen at all. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already upon us. It was that Stephen King full dark, no stars kind of nights too. Due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy, we were in a patch of woods that we weren't very familiar with. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole new ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was enclosed by a triangle of roads. All we had to do was walk in a straight line, and we would come out somewhere on one of the roads then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. So we started walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is almost impossible to do without a compass, which I didn't have. So we were both figuratively and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. A couple minutes into the walk we heard a loud scream, as if someone was being murdered. Now I know what every animal in the woods around here sounds like both normally, or in panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some predator like a coyote or fox. This was not that. At all. After waiting a couple minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction we thought we should be going. We didn't talk much about what we had just heard, probably because of the anxiety we were both feeling. We couldn't ignore it for long though because we heard another long, blood-curdling scream. It was closer this time and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a woman being attacked. This new scream sounded threatening. Ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point. Still we pushed forward. After walking about another 100 yards we came across something very strange. Directly in our path were these weird, clear, 
gelatinous masses on top of the leaf litter. Now I am 32 which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from experience, but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us. So take it from me, these clear globs should not have been there. The only thing I could think of that could even slightly look like it was tree sap, and this was absolutely not sap. I poked one of the masses with a stick fearing what they were made of. I had read a story about a town that had clear, gelatinous globs rained down on them. A lot of these people got very sick, and if I'm not mistaken I think a couple of them even died from it. So needless to say, I was taking precautions. Their consistency was that of a thick gelatin. Like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. Once we started walking again, we started to come across a good amount of this stuff. It wasn't all over the woods. Instead it was directly in front of us as we walked. Almost like someone or something knew which route we would try to take and marked it with these globs. Another scream. This time even closer and with a little something added in. This time, not too far away from us, we heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap. Something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was unlikely. Whatever it was wasn't spooked at all. Not from us or the threatening scream. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal and they start running. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This sent our anxiety level through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about floating men, screams, or alien jelly. We just wanted out, which should have been very soon. The distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but it hadn't yet. Strangers still we couldn't even see any house or street lights at all. Still we just kept walking, thinking we'd find our way out very, very soon. This was not to be, at least not yet. Our flashlights were now beginning to die so we were definitely in a hurry. Which by the way, is not what you should do if you were ever even maybe lost in the woods. Cool heads always prevail in that situation. Anyway, as we were walking we started to see a couple of pine trees. This was very strange because we had thoroughly scouted this land. The only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a couple more, we started to get a foreboding feeling. Almost like a sick, anxious, panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings and found that at the exact spot that we stopped was the same spot we started. We were standing right next to a pine tree with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off and dangling still from the severed limb. How could this be? We had been sure that we were walking in a somewhat straight shot out, but that must have been an impossibility since we must have made a circle. We had no idea whatsoever how this had happened, especially since we were in the exact spot we started at. Also very strange. We see my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree. It was very close to us, but when we started to walk out it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it, and immediately found the trail that we had to take to get out of the woods. It led directly back to my uncle's backyard. The trail actually went right past the live pine tree we had just been standing under. There is in no way we had missed that in the beginning. To add more to the strangeness, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail we could plainly see my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Our minds were blown, but at least we were able to get out. On the last 100 yards on the trail, we found more clear gelatin globs directly down the middle of the pass. This was definitely crazy because they absolutely were not there when we walked in. We had both been on that trail when we entered the woods. We would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves and the twigs break, but we had a strong feeling of being watched when we were still in the woods, 
and an even stronger version of that same feeling as we stepped into my uncle's backyard. This is at the top of my list for scariest experiences in the woods. I have no explanation for any one part of it. Not the floating ghost guy. Not the screams or the globs. Not the getting lost in the woods. And not the circles of boulders. I would love to hear from anyone who had anything like this happen to them. There has to be some kind of answer. But at this point all I have is my story about what had happened that night. And thankfully one other person who went through it with me. At least he has been able to validate what had happened to people that don't believe this actually happened to us. Whether you guys believe it or not is up to you, but I promise that this all happened exactly how I wrote it. I know it sounds pretty crazy and out there, but this stuff actually happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. Something incredible had happened back there. I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything bad happen to us. What it did do was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. One day I'm going to go back there by myself and camp for a night or two in the hopes that something might happen again and that I have the wherewithal to seek whatever it was out and get some answers that I desperately need. Fourth story. Not deer in California. A few years ago, I had to commute for my job from about October 2018 to January of 2019. It was nothing special, a retail job, but I live in a rural area in the California foothills, and it was my only option at the time. I would be driving home every night at 11 p.m. to 2 a.m., depending of when I would get off of work. The highway was always deserted at these times, and some nights were more peculiar than others, but nothing so extreme as this story. It wasn't uncommon for me to see a lot of wildlife on these drives. I would just take it slow and be alert. Black-tailed deer, coyotes, raccoons, I was well accustomed to them at this point. One particular night, I was only about 10 minutes from home. I rolled up to the usual four-way stop I'd stopped at hundreds of times before. It was probably around 1 a.m., not a soul around. As I came to a complete stop, I saw something standing just off the side of the road across from the intersection. It was obviously an animal and it was headed towards the road. So I was going to wait for it to cross to continue. It took me a second to really comprehend what it was. At first I thought it was a horse, which although dangerous, wouldn't be that uncommon for where I live due to irresponsible ranchers and their constantly broken fences. Then as I started to be able to make more of it out as it neared the light from my headlights, I realized something was really wrong with this animal. It was tall, so much so the legs looked stilt-like. As I sat there, shocked, it slowly stepped into the road across from my car and into the direct beam of my headlights. At this point I realized two things. One, it was taller than my car. Two, its gait was very odd, almost like it didn't know how to properly walk as a deer should. It was like all of its joints wanted to bend the wrong way. It moved slowly into the oncoming lane and then swiveled its head to look at me. All the hair rose on my body. What spooked me the most was it was certainly a deer, or at least something that really looked like one. It looked normal in every way except the spider-like legs it was standing on. At this point I gassed it, and the deer stood unmoving as my car sped past. I looked into my rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of it, crossing the oncoming lane back into the shoulder of the highway, illuminated red by my brake lights. When I got home, I ran from my car to my house and locked myself in, still understandably freaked out. I never saw it again and when I posted about it later in a community forum, I was told many others have seen other off deer in the area and that I'd become desensitized to it after a while. They left it at that. Wasn't until recently I learned about the not deer, and it makes me wonder. Fifth story. Someone is spray painting the polar bears near my town. I live in a small town called Churchill in northern Manitoba. It probably isn't the nicest little town in the world. 
Winter gets cold as hell, and with how remote we are, we get some problems with wildlife. But I guess the tourism isn't that bad all things considered. During the busy season, we can see as many as 10,000 or so people passing through just to see the sights. Although during the rest of the year, it's quiet and that suits me just fine. I like the quiet. Nobody really causes trouble out here, which is good for me since I'm literally the sheriff around these parts. I get a handful of calls every few months about the odd dispute between residents. But there's otherwise not much to write home about in that department. We don't have a lot of people living out this way, and everyone's spread pretty thin. Although even if everyone was packed together, the folks here really aren't that inclined towards fighting each other. We've got a nice, tight-knit little community out here. Nine times out of ten, when I get a call it isn't about the people in town. Hell it ain't even about the tourists. It's about what the tourists come to see. It's about the bears. See. Churchill has something of a reputation as the polar bear capital of the world. There are a lot of bears that pass through this way during their annual migration, and that can pose a bit of a problem. You mostly see them late in the year, around October and November. People generally know better than to mess around with them, but most everyone in town has their stories. Sometimes you'll hear a noise outside and look out your window to see a bear looking right back in at you. A lot of folks around these parts are liable to leave their car doors unlocked in case anyone needs a quick hiding place in a pinch. Some people will tell you about coming face to face with one of them out on the street at night and scaring it off with their phone. Then there are some folks who genuinely don't give a rip about the bears. I've seen a couple of old timers stare them right in the eye as they walked past, daring them to make a move. Now. As I'm sure most people are aware, polar bears are pretty darn dangerous. All bears can be. Really. But polar bears especially so. You cross a polar bear, and that's it. Say goodnight, buddy. That all said, I do consider us fairly lucky. There aren't as many attacks as you might think. People are smart enough to know how to avoid conflicts with the bears, and we do what we can to keep them out of the town. We set bear traps to lure them in, and we've got an entire police force dedicated to dealing with them. We prefer not to kill the bears if we can avoid it. We just monitor them. We hit them with a dart full of telezol to knock them right out, and either move them safely out of town or down to the polar bear jail. I've met a few folks who think the concept of a polar bear jail is pretty funny, but honestly, it's worked alright for us so far. We keep them there for about two to three weeks without food so they don't associate us with a free meal. The bears don't starve or anything. They can keep going for a while just off their stored fat. Then once they've either done their time or we need some space, we fly them out into the tundra on a helicopter. We tag them so we can tell if we run into them again. Mark them with a green. So anyone hunting them for their meat knows they've had drugs in their system. Then we let the bear go. The idea is that the bear will remember the rough time we gave it and take care to avoid getting too close to town in the future. We get some repeat offenders, sure, but some of them seem to get the message. I want to be clear about one thing. I don't hate the bears. You don't spend years dealing with them like I have without developing a certain respect and appreciation for them. They're just animals. They only understand the fact that there's food in town and that they're hungry. Even when they attack and kill somebody, there's no malice or anything in what they're doing. Hunting and killing is just what they do, and while I never want to see anyone get hurt by a bear, I can't hate them for what's just in their nature. Truth be told, the best part of my job is probably bringing them back home into their natural habitat. I've got no illusions of the bears being thankful or anything. They don't understand the why of what we do in hell. I imagine that through the haze of drugs in their system, they're fantasizing about tearing me limb from bloody limb. But I'm still happy to see them go back to their lives and hopeful that I'll never see them again. So when I see that someone or something might be hurting those bears, well, 
That bothers me. It really, really bothers me. We saw our first numbered bear a couple of weeks back. We'd caught him in one of our traps by the garbage disposal site. You'll find a lot of bears out that way. They smell the rotting food and they just come running. They can't resist. So naturally, I wasn't that surprised to find a pissed off bear waiting for me in the trap. The traps we use consist of large steel cylinders with a grate on one end and an open door on the other. We hang a piece of seal meat at the end of the tube, and when the bear goes for it, the door slams shut. I could see the bear lying against the grate and I figured he'd been in there for a few hours. When he noticed me approaching I heard a thud from inside the cage, followed by a frustrated huff. I could see the bear moving inside as it tried to follow me with its gaze through the grate. I got in close to see if I could get a look at him. The grate was reinforced steel, so there wasn't really any chance of the bear getting through. It was a little dark to get a really great look at him, but from what I could see he had an ear tag on. We'd probably met before. The bear took a step back before ramming itself against the grate and letting out another angry huff. Sorry, buddy. I said, can't let you go wandering around out there, though. I gave the side of the trap a reassuring pat, then set to work hitching it to my truck to haul it off. This angry customer had a cell waiting for him back in the bear jail. Now, I didn't get a real good look at the bear until we actually had him back at the jail. We released him into one of the holding cells, and when I watched him step out of the trap, I immediately knew that something wasn't right. For starters, the bear had a number spray painted right along his side. I hadn't seen it while he'd been in the trap. It had been too dark inside, and I'd only really seen him from the front. But now it was impossible to miss. The number 54 was clear as day along his side. Now, that was certainly unusual, but I could have just explained it away as a marker from some research team to keep track of him. As I said before, we mark the bears ourselves when we release them so that anyone hunting them for their meat knows they've been drugged. The thing that concerned me was the way the bear moved. It was sluggish and jerky. I hadn't darted it when it was in the trap, so unless someone else had drugged it, that obviously wasn't normal. The poor thing looked almost ready to fall over, from the way it drunkenly shuffled around. It was oddly skinny too. We've seen bears over the past few years who couldn't save up enough fat to get them through the summer months when the ice melts. But this didn't look like that. The bear's body was thinner than it should have been, but its belly was really bloated. It kept shaking its head as if something was bothering it as it paced around the cage. That's a weird looking one, no? The question came from one of the guys who'd helped me get the bear into the cell, a fella named Taylor Neifer. Taylor was a good guy, and he was probably about as big as a bear himself. Yes it is, I said. Could be sick. Maybe. Might need to call someone. Think we should we isolate it from the other bears? Taylor suggested. He's already in his own cage. I said after a few moments. If he's got something it isn't likely to spread. We'll keep an eye on him though. What do you make of those numbers on his side? Who do you think left it with those? Taylor just shook his head. I dunno. He admitted, I haven't heard anything about a study being conducted in the area or anything. You'd think they'd give us a heads up. Think it's got any connection to his condition? I dunno. I said with a shrug, guess we'll find out if we see more, I guess. Funny you should mention that, that ain't the first numbered bear I've seen this week. I raised an eyebrow as I looked over at Taylor. No shitting? We've got another one? Taylor gestured for me to follow him and led me towards another cell. He just came in the other day. Found him wandering around just outside of town. This one looks a little off too, but not quite as bad. He said as we walked. The cell in question was just a few down from the one-eyed, just deposited our new friend into. I took a look through the bars to see the bear in question lying down near the back of the cage. It glanced at us before going back to ignoring us. 
Sure enough, it was spray-painted just like the one I'd brought in had been. The number 89 was printed bold on its side. The bear was panting and pretty clearly restless, but not quite as scrawny as the other one was. Oh, and this one was a real stubborn bastard to bring in. Taylor said, he ran for the tundra. We had to get him from the helicopter. As soon as he saw it, he ran for a nearby pond and started using the trees for cover. You see, the bears do that a lot, usually with repeat offenders. They figure out that we can't shoot them if they're hiding under trees, and we won't shoot them if they're near water. If you shoot a bear and it goes into the water, it's probably not coming out before the drug kicks in and that bear is going to drown. By the time we got him, it took about three shots to get him down. Three? I asked, looking over at Taylor. Usually one dart was enough to take down a bear. I'd never heard of a bear taking three before the drug got the better of him. You didn't think you might kill him? I asked. We were worried about it, but we were following him for a while. First two darts barely had any effect. We hit him dead on two, right between the neck and the shoulder. That should have taken him right down, but he barely even seemed to slow. He was headed into town, so we made a call. Turns out three was the magic number, I guess. Jesus, any tags on him? I asked. No, this one's brand new. The bear huffed and stood up, pacing around the back of the cage restlessly. Taylor and I watched it for a few moments before leaving it be. From what I heard over the next week or so, our new resident, number 54, seemed fine despite how sick he seemed. I checked in on him a couple of times. He didn't seem one to rest on his haunches and paced his cell constantly, clawing at the walls as if he was hoping to break them. When he did let himself rest, he seemed to flop down onto his side to avoid putting any pressure on his bloated belly. Taylor had mentioned that one of the veterinarians we had on call had come in, but as far as I'd heard, they hadn't been able to figure out exactly what was wrong with the bear. For the most part, it seemed in excellent health. Their theory was that it hadn't managed to store up enough fat last year and was suffering the effects of it now. A tragic case, but not something we'd never seen before. With less ice forming to support the bear's hunting, feeding and storing fat becomes a lot harder for them. At that point, we were in a sort of unspoken agreement that the bear would probably die if he went too long without food. I figured that they would either make an exception and feed the poor thing, or release it early to give it the chance to hunt. Personally, I was hoping they'd just opt to feed it. It seemed like the kinder option. I ran into our third numbered bear about a week after I met my first one. There'd been a call that had come in about a bear sniffing around someone's backyard one night. I was the closest so I drove off to see if I could either scare it off or catch it. When I pulled up to the house, I could see the pale white shape of a bear wandering around the side of the house, trying to peek in through the windows. Chances are he'd smelled something good in there and was curious. Judging by the mess of garbage in the backyard, he'd gotten into their trash and was still hungry. This bear was a big one, although a lot thinner than he ought to be. He wasn't quite as thin as 54, but his stomach had a similar bloat to it. From the road, I could see the number spray painted on his side. 29. I saw his head come up to look at me when he saw the headlights of my truck. He studied me for a few minutes before inching a little closer to the road to investigate. That seemed a little odd. Usually, the bears wanted nothing to do with us and kept their distance. I slowed my truck to a crawl as I loaded some blanks into my service revolver and hung it out the window before firing it up into the sky. Crack, crack, crack. The bear jumped back a little in surprise, eyes remaining on me. It seemed to hesitate for a moment before turning and jogging along the side of the house, headed towards a more heavily wooded area. The bear stopped just short of the tree lean to look back at me and stared at my truck as if waiting for me to make the next move. I fired three more blanks. 
The bear flinched but didn't run this time. It almost seemed like he'd realized that the sound wasn't actually a threat. I switched tactics. The terrain was smooth enough for me to get my truck up, so I veered into the people's yard. I hit my horn, blaring it to see if the bear wound run. It did and it didn't. It turned and paced along the tree lean, ducking behind the trees but not going much further. It was putting some distance between us, but keeping me in its eye line. The bastard was probably just waiting to see if I'd follow him, or go away. I honked again. The bear didn't move. This one had some balls on him, it seemed. I rested my foot on the brake and reached for the shotgun in my passenger seat. I loaded it with some firecracker rounds and hung the barrel out the window, shooting them up into the sky. The bear looked up at the burst of light high above my car and jogged a little further away, staying just behind the tree lean the whole time. All he'd really done was end up on the other side of the yard. I fired off a few more firecracker shots. The bear watched them but didn't run this time. For a moment, there was silence as the bear sized me up. Then, it slowly began to creep into the yard again, heading for the garbage it had been sifting through earlier, sniffing all the while. Little bastard. I'd never known a bear to be this brave. Usually, the blanks and the firecracker shells did the trick. I blared my horn and lurched my truck forward. The bear looked up at me, before going back to the garbage. Bastard. I put the truck into park and reached into the back for my hunting rifle. I kept an eye on the bear as I loaded it up with a dart and moved the truck to get a better shot. This time the bear didn't even look at me. Bastard. I watched the bastard sniff around for a bit and chew on something he'd fished off the ground as I lined up my shot. He wasn't really moving so it was an easy shot to make, but it had to be perfect. You want to shoot a bear between the neck and the shoulder. The drug takes effect faster that way. Do it right and in about three minutes, that bear is down. Well, I had my shot and I took it. I hit that bear dead on. I knew I did. I've done it enough times. He jumped when he felt the dart hit him and took off like a shot toward the trees. Seems like I'd finally gotten through to him. I watched him from the truck as he ducked behind the cover of the trees and turned to watch me again. For a couple of minutes, I stared back at him. He stood defiant, occasionally turning his head to gnash his teeth at the dart. But otherwise, he seemed just fine. I might have sworn under my breath as I started wondering if maybe I needed to take another shot. Taylor had mentioned that the other numbered bear he'd found had taken some punishment. Maybe another shot was worth it? I weighed my options for a few minutes as the bear started to pace. His movement seemed fine. He didn't look sluggish or anything. He moved just like a healthy bear should. Eventually, I figured that I'd take the risk. I loaded up another shot and took aim. The bear had calmed down from my first shot and was debating going back to the garbage. He stuck his head out of the trees and stared expectantly at me. I flashed my lights at him and watched him flinch, but he didn't move. He was just giving me the perfect shot. So I took it. The dart hit the bear perfectly, just like the last one did. The bastard jumped and took off back into the woods. This time, he seemed to get the message and vanished into the dark. I saw him heading over a small rocky outcrop before losing sight of him completely. I'd expected this, but I wasn't exactly happy about it. I'd have a hell of a time getting him out of those trees when the drug took effect. If the drug took effect, I molded over for a few moments before calling in some backup. I heard Taylor's voice over the radio replying to me. I'm on my way. See you soon, Rob. Load in some live rounds. I warned him. This bastard's tricky. I don't know if he's down. Stubborn, huh? Taylor asked. Yup. And numbered. 29. There was silence on the other end of the radio. Live rounds then. Taylor finally repeated. About five to ten minutes later, 
I saw his headlights coming up the driveway as he pulled up close to me. He stepped out of his truck and loaded up his shotgun. I got out to greet him. Another numbered bear, huh? He asked. He darted. Twice. I said, to know how well he handled the second dose. Guess we're going to find out. Taylor laughed. Maybe we'll get lucky. He said before gesturing for me to lead the way. Unfortunately, this is the most dangerous part of the job. When a darted bear runs off into somewhere, where you can't get him out, you need to go in after him. I don't like having to use live rounds on a bear. But in a situation like that where you're out of the car and it's life or death, you need it. Taylor and I stepped past the tree lean, each of us with our guns at the ready. I gestured up toward the ridge I'd seen the bear go over, and we figured we'd go around it and see if we could find any tracks. We found one better. The bastard hadn't gone far. He'd made it about 15 feet before the drug seemed to have taken effect. As far as I could tell, he looked out. I called out to it. Bear. The bear didn't move. Bear. Bear. Taylor was calling too now. Still no response from the bear. That was a good thing. We drew closer. The bear lay on its side. Its breathing looked awful heavy. I nudged it with my boot and stepped back. The bear didn't react. Taylor heaved a sigh of relief. Guess you got him. He said. Guess I did. I replied. You want to keep an eye on him? I can get a stretcher from my truck and we can haul him out of here. Yeah, you go on. Taylor said. I got him. I nodded and turned away heading back to the trucks and feeling some of the tension start to drain from me. Then I heard the gunshots. I turned around suddenly, just in time to see Taylor backing away from the bastard as fast as he could. The bear was shakily pulling itself to its feet again. I watched Taylor put three or four shells into it. I could see blood dribbling out of its wounds. But the bastard didn't even flinch. I raised my shotgun and took aim, firing at the bear from the side. But it just shrugged off the buckshot like it was nothing and charged full speed at Taylor. There wasn't a damn thing I could do. There wasn't a damn thing he could have done either. The bear hit him like a goddamn train, bringing its full weight down on him. I saw one final muzzle flash and heard Taylor scream before it closed its jaws around his head. I sprinted towards the bear, unloading three more rounds into its neck and side, hoping to God I could stop it. The buckshot should have killed it. I could see bloody, ragged holes in the bear's fur. Its distended belly had split open and pieces of it seemed to be hanging out. Taylor's shotgun fired one last time, sending shotgun pellets through the bear's neck and head. Then I heard a sickening crunch as the bear's jaws cracked Taylor's skull and I knew that he was past saving. I took aim at the bastard's head and fired my last rounds into it. I saw pieces of skull and brain matter torn off its head. I could see exposed bone on one side of its face. The bastard just turned to look at me. He only had one good eye left. Half his face had been completely blown away leaving nothing but a gory, bloody, broken skull behind. Half his lower jaw was missing. The bastard shuffled away from Taylor and tried to come for me next. But its strength was failing it and fast. The bear's entrails spilled out of its split belly, leaving a trail behind it. Its legs wobbled as it lunged weakly toward me. Then they finally gave out beneath its weight. The bastard hit the ground, but it was somehow still breathing. Christ, the damn thing must have lost most of its blood, but somehow it still seemed to be alive. I stared at it in this mix of awe and horror. I looked at its broken skull, and I swear I could see something on it. Something I didn't think had been there before. It almost looked like something was growing out of the bear's exposed brain. I swear to God it almost looked like some sort of mushroom. I hastily reloaded my shotgun before taking aim directly at the bear's exposed brain. 
Its one good eye watched me intently as I pulled the trigger. I fired three last shotgun shells into its skull, and when I was done, there wasn't much of a head left. The bastard finally slumped to the ground. This time I was sure he wasn't getting up. I ran to Taylor's side, but I already knew that he was dead. The bear had damn near torn his head off. The most I could do for him was close his eyes. Then I went for my radio and I called for backup and an ambulance. I've said before that I don't blame the bears for what they are. I still didn't. It hurt me to lose Taylor. He was a good man with a good family he'd left behind. But I didn't blame the bear. The bear had a tag on him. We'd seen him a few times before. Hell, we'd seen him in the bear jail a few weeks prior. I'd been there when we released that bear. Three weeks ago it had been a normal bear. Three weeks later and now, it hurt me to have to kill that bear. Even after what it had done to Taylor, it was probably scared. Lashing out when wounded. That was all. I couldn't hate it for that, even as much as parted of me wanted to. I went over the situation again and again in my mind, wondering if I should have darted the bear a third time. But that would have just risked killing it. I wondered if maybe I could have saved Taylor, but I'd watched him shoot that bear while it had gotten up. By rights, he should have killed it long before it got to him. But that bear just wouldn't die. There was nothing more he could have done. I didn't blame the bear. But I wondered if maybe I needed to blame whoever was numbering them. I heard a couple of days later that Bear 89 had damaged the concrete in his cage. Left unattended, he was likely to get out. The guys back at the jail had talked it over and decided to release him early. They tried drugging him, and just like before he hadn't gone down, they darted him again and again until the bear finally collapsed. And when he did the drug killed him. It had been a while since I'd heard of them overdosing a bear like that. I knew we'd only been having problems with these numbered bears. There was something about them. Something that was messing with them somehow. Making them more resistant to the drugs and more aggressive. I'd asked about any researchers in the area. I'd heard nothing back. So I figured I'd do some research of my own. I got a few days away from work on account of what had happened with Taylor. After taking the first couple to process everything and do some digging, I took the third day to head out into the tundra. I used my own personal truck to head out there. I knew some of the safer, less bumpy routes and brought my radio with me just in case I ran into any trouble. I wasn't really sure what I'd find. The bastard had been released a few hundred kilometers outside of town. I figured that whatever had happened to him must have happened somewhere between where he was released and town, so I figured I'd head out in that direction and see what I could find. I drove for a couple of hours, passing a few landmarks I recognized from my past helicopter trips out there. I had to take some detours to get past some of the rougher terrain, so my path wasn't that clear. But I was getting there. After about two hours, I saw a numbered bear. This one was stalking the tundra, probably looking for food. It regarded me with a little bit of curiosity, but otherwise kept its distance. On its side was the number 102. It looked reasonably healthy. I kept driving. I saw another numbered bear about a half hour later. This one bloated and sickly looking. Its number was 32. Not too long after that, I found my first corpse. Number 11. I stopped to study it for a few minutes, staying in my car as I looked it over. Like a lot of the other bears, this one was skeletally thin and its stomach was bloated. Although there was something very different about this bear. It didn't look like it had been dead long, but I could see stalks of pale brownish mushrooms poking up through its eyes and mouth. Some of the mushrooms even jutted out of its fur. I wondered what the hell had happened to it. As I studied that bear, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye and looked over. There was another truck driving through the tundra, a white Chevy with some official-looking logo on it. FRB. In the bed, 
I could see the shape of another dead bear. I figured that wasn't a coincidence. I put my truck in gear and moved to follow it. There aren't a lot of places to hide in the tundra, and there aren't a lot of other cars out that way. I had no illusions of stealth, but I had to know where they were going. If the truck saw me, they clearly didn't care. They just kept driving, eventually finding their way onto a dirt road that didn't look like it had been there long. Up ahead, I could see the coastline and a collection of metal trailers right by the beach. That must have been where they were coming from. Looking around, I saw a bear staring warily toward the buildings. 114 tagged on its side. As I got closer to the trailers, I caught a few glimpses of whatever was behind them. There was something on the beach. The trailers weren't that close to it, and I couldn't see it clearly. But I could see two or three bears gathered around it. The truck in front of me slowed to a stop near one of the trailers. As it did, I saw a man in a black coat stepping out of it. He was either of Korean or Japanese descent, with a top knot and stern eyes. He didn't even look at the truck that had just arrived. He was looking right at me. Guess this was the welcome wagon. I slowed my truck to a stop a few feet away and got out slowly, putting my hands up as a gesture that I meant no harm. The man just kept staring at me, his brow furrowed in a cold frustration. This is a private research facility, he said. He had a calm but commanding voice, you're trespassing. Get in your vehicle, turn around and go home. I'm with the Churchill police. I said, I'm not looking for any trouble. My name's Rob Barling. I'm just looking into some odd bears we've been seeing out our way. Bears tagged with numbers. I glanced at the corpse of the dead bear in the other truck. Number 17. Know anything about that? The man smiled and laughed softly. We're a long way from Churchill, Mr. Barling. He said, you don't have jurisdiction here. Even if you did, what we're doing is perfectly legal. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist that you leave. And just what the hell is it that you're doing? I asked. The man smiled but didn't respond. I glanced past the trailers at whatever was on the beach. I still couldn't see it clearly. Some sort of animal, perhaps? A beached whale or something but... No. It looked all wrong. This is a scientific outpost. The man said, stepping dutifully to block my view of whatever was on the beach. We're researching the bears. Hence the need for tagging them. As for what we're researching, I'm not at liberty to say. Now, if you're done, the hell I am. You've seen the state of these damn bears. Bloated, sick-looking, violent. I've got a friend lying cold in his grave right now because of whatever the hell you're doing with these bears and I deserve a goddamn answer. I took a step toward the man and as I did... He pulled a pistol from his holster and aimed it square at my head. Then unless you'd like to join your friend in the grave, you'll stop testing my patience. He said, his tone not even changing a little. Nobility, leave the goddamn man alone. I heard another voice say, a middle-aged woman with long blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail was stepping out of the trailer. Put the gun away before you kill somebody. The man, nobility just huffed before holstering his weapon. My apologies. My associate here is a little trigger happy. Research isn't usually his department. So, you're with the Churchill police, right? I'm Director Amanda Spencer. I'm the director of the FRB. Which is what, exactly? Classified, she replied, reaching into her pocket for a cigarette. She looked me dead in the eye as she lit it. Look, I admire that you were willing to come all the way out here looking for answers. I wouldn't mind some of that gusto and some of the guys working for me, but I hate to tell you that nobility is right. We're not obliged to share what's going on out here with you. This is out of your jurisdiction. Well, it ain't anymore. I said. She laughed and took a drag on her cigarette. 
You're funny. I'm serious. Whatever the hell you're doing to these bears, it stops. Now. Whatever we're doing to the bears? She asked, raising an eyebrow. She looked back at the carcass on the beach. The bears are doing it to themselves. We're the ones trying to fix this. She turned to look at what was on the beach. But in order to fix it, we need to understand it. To understand it, we need specimens. We need to see how it affects them. We need to see how it's affected by different variables. It's a process. Not an easy one, but it is a process. And until you can fix it, you're just gonna let these sick bears wander the tundra then? I asked. Because they're wandering into people's backyards. Someone's already dead. And you have my condolences? Spencer replied. But what would you have us do instead? Shoot every single bear we think might have eaten something they shouldn't have? There will be some that slip through the cracks anyways it spreads all the same only now. The bears aren't conveniently marked for you. No. You may not like it. The methodology may be... Ugly. But it's necessary that it be done this way. I don't think I agree with that. I said. Spencer took another drag on her cigarette. Whether or not you agree isn't relevant. With that, she turned away from me. I've been very polite and given you much more information than I should. But you really should go. Whether you drive or nobility drives is up to you. But we're done here. No, we aren't. I insisted. I tried to follow her as she walked away only to feel nobility's hand on my shoulder. Yes, we are. He said softly. I felt the burn of a taser as he jammed it into my stomach. The next thing I knew I was falling. And that was it. I woke up in my own home that evening. My mouth dry and my body weak. My truck was parked out front. It was as if I'd never even left. But I knew I had. I know what I saw out there. I've tried to get in touch with a bunch of different people. But nobody's listening. Whoever those people were. The FRB. They don't give a damn about the people of Churchill. Those sick bears are still coming into town. There's nobody stopping them. One of my colleagues tells me there was a bear attack the other day. A man got torn apart walking home from work. He tells me he's never seen anything like it. He tells me that a witness to the attack said that one of the bears had a number painted on its fur. It's not going to stop. Nobody else is listening. So I've got to get the word out. 